Welcome to the Thai Danish Cooperation on the Biocircular Green Economy Model webinar series. Today is the first of the three sessions, the policymaker session, and covering Denmark's path to biocircular economy, lessons learned for Thailand's BCG economy model. Today, the Royal Thai Embassy is very honored to have Dr. Lili Wilaijit, Vice President of Thailand's National Science and Technology Development Agency, or NASDA, as a moderator for today's session. And without further ado, I would like to give the screen so to speak to Dr. Lili. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Varanya Chantapan from Royal Thai Embassy in Denmark for an introduction. So good afternoon here in Thailand and good morning there in Denmark. It is my honor to take part in the forum on biocircular green economy, also called BCG, and to moderate this policy session to build a momentum for the business forum to follow in the next two days. As Denmark is one of the global front runners in the biocircular green economy, this event provides a great opportunity to draw a mutual interest and opportunities for fruitful collaboration in BCG between Thailand and Denmark. I would like to start our session by calling upon Mr. Tanakum Rimchara, Charge of the Fair Royal Thai Embassy, Copenhagen, and His Excellency Mr. Jan Tuoko, Ambassador of Denmark to Thailand, to deliver opening remarks. First, please welcome Mr. Tanakum Rimchara. Your Excellencies, Mr. Jan Tuoko, Ambassador of Denmark to Thailand, distinguished speakers, dear participants, it is my great pleasure and honor to welcome you to the Thai Danish Corporation on Biocircular Green Economy Models webinar series. The webinar series was initiated by the Royal Thai Embassy in Copenhagen in collaboration with the National Science and Technology Development Agency, or NASDA, and Thailand Board of Investment, or BOI. We envision that our future lies in the biocircular and green economy. The webinar is also one of the activities to celebrate the 400th anniversary of the first contact between Thailand and Denmark in 2021. Back in 1621, a Danish trading envoy arrived at the seaport town of the Nau Sea, which belonged to Siam at the time, marking the first recorded contact between the two countries. Since then, Thailand and Denmark have enjoyed close relations characterized by the cordial ties between our royal families, vibrant economic and technical cooperation, as well as strong people to people contacts. This year, the Royal Thai government declared the biocircular green economy or the BCG model as a national agenda. It is a new economic model for inclusive and sustainable growth by seeking to capitalize on Thailand biodiversity while strengthening the capacity of local community and optimizing the use of new technology and innovation. It is not a coincidence that Denmark is one of the global front runners in the biocircular green economy. Our historical friendship has stood the test of time. 400 years later, we look forward to a new chapter of relations with a shared goal of building an economy that is healthier, greener, and more inclusive. Therefore, the BCG economy models present an area of mutual interest and new opportunity for both countries. The webinar series will consist of three sessions. Today, policy maker session, uncovering Denmark part to a circular by all economy, lesson learned for Thailand BCG economy models, has brought together key stakeholders from Thailand and Denmark to exchange experience and lesson learned. Whereas the next two sessions, we will aim to promote new business and investment partnership between Thailand and Denmark in the BCG related industries. I am fully confident that this webinar series will be a success with important takeaways for both sides to continue working together 
to promote a fruitful partnership in the BCG models. Lastly, I would like to thank our co organizer from both sides, namely the National Science and Technology Development Agency and Thailand Board of Investment, as well as the supporting organizations, including the Eastern Economic Corridor Office, the Royal Danish Embassy in Bangkok, the State of Green, the Danish Agriculture and Food Council, and the Danish Thai Chamber of Commerce for making this webinar possible. I wish you all an interesting and insightful webinar. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Tanapum Bimshara, for your remarks. And now, please welcome His Excellency, Mr. Yon Tuoko. Thank you so much. Ladies and gentlemen, Your Excellencies and Chancellor Affairs, Mr. Tanapon. Thank you so much for inviting me to say a few words today. I would very much like to congratulate the National Science Technology Development Agency and the Royal Thai Embassy in Copenhagen for successfully arranging this webinar. I'm very impressed with the program and look forward to the discussion in the next three days. Here at the Royal Danish Embassy in Bangkok, we are pleased to be partner of the webinar and contribute to public and private partnerships between our two kingdoms. As mentioned, it is a special year to talk about cooperation because it is 400 years since ago the first ships arrived in Thailand from Denmark. And since then, we have built a number of different relations, technical between our royal families and commercial. And when it comes to the commercial side, more than 100 Danish companies are today present in Thailand. But let's make sure that we continue to create traces of each other in each other's countries. I think that today's topic is very interesting, and I think the Danish government in particular has done a lot to put the circular economy high on the political agenda. And we will today listen to different authorities and ministries to show what we have done in Denmark. I think it's important that we talk about how we can move this agenda across multiple different sectors from agriculture to building materials. I think it's important that we take and move away from the take, make, and waste economy to a reuse, repair, refurbish, and recycle economy. And the Danish government actually took a step towards that in 2018 when we had a strategy launched where especially the private sector got a special role. But also the present government with their very ambitious goal to reduce CO2 has definitely put this on the agenda. It is an important target to continue and develop. Circular economy, I want to say there's two reasons why it is particularly important. Circular economy, green economy is good business. And I also think public-private partnership can be the one that can drive this. Talking about why it's good business, we will definitely face consumers that will choose products based on their environmental friendliness. Capgemini made a global survey and said two-thirds of all the consumers would choose products that are more environmental friendly. So we do not have a choice. Consumers will make that choice for us. Secondly, as my good colleagues in Denmark probably will tell you, they, you can lower costs by actually reducing the input into your production. So as my good friend from the Agricultural Council normally say, that more with less. We hope that we can definitely see that in the future. And we know that already that Danish companies are sourcing and looking into how they can actually make a more efficient pipeline of the supply chain. But also the public-private sector cooperation are important. It is so important that we have it very high on the Danish government's uh, priorities. It is important to reduce food loss, waste, agonic, agonic farming, waste handling, and green public procurement are some of the things we need to put into the equation. We even were the, one of the first countries, or we were the first country that actually established the Minister of Environment. And they are today responsible for actually uh, putting together different initiatives regarding recycling, sustainable design, and circular construction of raw materials. But we need to work together public and privately. Therefore, 
just a few examples. I was happy to see that some of the Danish companies we're working with here are uh, contributing to that and showcasing these examples. Grundfos, as an example, are using less energy to cool big buildings, and therefore you can reduce the waste when you produce energy. We have other companies. Thailand is a strong food producing company, country, and we can see companies actually providing ingredients that can make sure that you can extend the lifetime of products. So from my side, I'm so happy to be part of this today. I'm sure that we can foster more exchange of know-how, create new partnerships, and I'm looking very much forward to listening in these uh, coming three days, and especially making sure that we participate and help companies and our public, serve, uh, public partners to cooperate. Thank you so much for being uh, part of this. Uh, I'm really looking forward to these three days. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Mr. Yon Toko, for your remarks. So before we start the today's agenda, I would like to inform that each speaker will have 10 minutes for their talk. There will be Q&A only at the end of the seminar. And questions can be submitted via the chat box. And please also state for whom the questions are. Our staff will gather those questions and they will be asked later in the Q&A session. Please also be informed that the session will be recorded. Thank you. So there is a slight change in our program today. So for our first speaker, I'm pleased to introduce Mr. Finn Mortensen. Mr. Mortensen is Executive Director of State of Green. And his talk is entitled State of Green, a Public-Private Partnership Driving Denmark's Transition to Green and Circular Economy. So please welcome Mr. Mortensen. Good morning, good afternoon. Thank you very much for your kind introduction. It's a great pleasure for me to be part of today's session celebrating the 400 years of relations between Thailand and Denmark. State of Green, just a few words about us, is a, what you call a public-private partnership, not for profit. Our job is to facilitate relations between Denmark and international stakeholders. We serve international political and commercial decision makers. And as you can see on the slide here, we are in the middle between the public sector and the private sector. Behind us is the Danish government represented by four ministries, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, the Ministry of Climate, Energy and Utilities, the Ministry of Environment and the Ministry of Industry, Business and Financial Affairs. And on the private side, we have the four major business organizations. One of them is actually the one uh, arranging today's event, the Danish Agriculture and Food Council. If you want to look deeper into what State of Green does, I would recommend you take a look at our website, stateofgreen.com. Here you'll see that also we do have His Royal Highness Crown Prince Frederick as our patron. We came, we came to, into being in 2008, and our job is to foster relations between international stakeholders and Danish commercial and government entities. We showcase Denmark as a green nation. We showcase green solutions within energy, water, circular city, circular economy, and cities. Under normal circumstances, we receive more than 180 delegations each year from around the world. Uh, we take, we invite them to come to Denmark. We put together visitor programs, and I'm glad to say that we have also hosted several Thai, uh, visitors from Thailand over uh, the past years. Now, just a few words about the Danish energy transition. It all started back in the 70s. Denmark was uh, totally dependent as a country on imported energy. We didn't have any oil or natural resources in Denmark. 
So when the first oil crisis hit the world, Denmark was very severely affected. On the screen, you can see we had very little renewable energy in our system, only about 2%. So the oil crisis was a genuine wake up call for Denmark. Uh, we started focusing on renewable energy. The government and parliament at the time decided to initiate a new energy track focusing not only on renewable energy, but also on energy efficiency and using a number of different means. Most interestingly, the so-called stick and carrot method, where you actually, uh, the government introduced very high taxes on all kinds of energy and encouraged citizens and businesses to cut down not only on their energy, but on resources in general by giving them economic incentives. Since then, we have had over the past decades, several very uh, important energy uh, initiatives from the government and parliament, all of them characterized by having broad political support. The most recent one was in December 2019, when we had the Danish Legally Binding Climate Act. The vision is to reduce CO2 emissions by 70% by 2030 compared to 1990. We're going to see early reductions already in emissions by 2025. We need to have climate neutrality in the waste and water sectors and oil and gas extraction in the North Sea will end by 2050 when Denmark will be totally independent of fossil fuels. To that purpose, the government and parliament at the time in 2019 decided to set up 13 so-called climate partnerships between government and business and industry. The idea was that these partnerships should come up with ideas on how to, what business could do and what kind of regulation would be needed in order to reach the 70% uh, reduction goal. Finally, just to mention one of the important elements of it was that we're going to construct two so-called energy islands in Denmark, one in the North Sea, one in the Baltic Sea. Here you can see what has actually been the result of this dedicated focus on energy efficiency and renewables. Since 1990, we have reduced our CO2 reductions considerably. We have at the same time been able to increase our GDP. So we have been able, you could say in a few words, to decouple economic growth from the use of energy. At the same time, through this strong focus on resources, we've also been able to reduce our water consumption by almost 40%. This uh, obviously had uh, an enormous effect also on the Danish economy. The green economy today is important in Denmark. We have close to 80,000 jobs here. It contributes more than 10% to our GDP and exports actually also important in terms of uh, green technologies. Now, if we look at the uh, uh, energy uh, consumption today, you can see on this slide that uh, a little more than 35% uh, of our energy comes from renewables. The biggest chunk is biomass, or more than half of it is from biomass. Uh, that's going to be reduced in coming years. We're going to see much more wind and uh, solar energy, and hopefully also more from bio <coughs> biogas and bio waste. I said a little, <clears throat> a little while ago that we had the National Climate Act in, in 2019 with the 70% reduction goal. Um, it followed it is followed by a number of concrete actions that are going to be annual action plans. We had the Danish Council on Climate Change set up. We had the Danish uh, Green Future Fund and we had, it was also laid down in the act that there had to be 10 year legally binding targets. The climate partnerships I mentioned before, here's a picture of the chairman of the 13 climate partnerships. Um, and uh, each of them represents a private sector, an industry. They actually ended up coming up with more than 400 different recommendations on how to reach the 70% target. Some of them business and industry could initiate themselves, others would require uh, government action in terms of changing of regulations and, and laws. Now, 
looking specifically on circular economy, uh, there was one partnership called Waste and Water Circular Economy, and they actually also came up with 14 concrete actions, uh, areas of actions that would uh, help the government reach the 70% goal. One of them being that 90% recycling of all waste should be ready already by 2030. As the Danish ambassador to Thailand said a few minutes ago, the government uh, at the time in 2018 already came up with a strategy for the circular economy. It's actually available in English. You can find it on, on our website, on State of Green's website. But, they, but this uh, action plan identified six key areas with 15 concrete uh, initiatives and uh, it's already on track. To sum up, you can say that over the past 35 years, we've come a very long way. Um, we came from a situation where we were totally dependent on imported oil. We didn't have any natural resources and the Danish economy was in a very tight spot at the time. Since then, through this dedicated focus on energy efficiency, circular economy and renewable energy, we've been able to come a very long way. And I think the my final words will be that we couldn't have done it without close collaboration and partnerships between government and business and industry. So thank you very much for your attention. And I hope you will have a fruitful uh, conference over the next three days. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Mortensen, for sharing us the private sector's point of view on the circular economy. Now let us hear from a viewpoint from governmental sector. Our next speaker is Mr. Aspen Tin Norberg, Chief Advisor, Danish Ministry of Food, Agriculture and Fisheries. He will give a talk on circular bioeconomy, taking stocks of Denmark's success, challenges, and what's next. So, Mr. Norberg, the floor is yours. Uh, the mic is not on. Please have the mic on, please. Yes, let me find. Okay, we can hear you now. Can you speak okay. louder? Thank you. Thank you very much. Can you hear me now? Yes, that's great. Thank you. Okay. Dear ladies and gentlemen, Sabadikap to all of you from uh, Thailand and uh, good morning to all of you from uh, Denmark. First of all, uh, thank you very much for uh, to the Thai embassy for the opportunity to, to uh, represent um, uh, the Danish government's view on this very important topic. I'm very proud to contribute uh, towards making the bonds between our countries stronger. In Denmark, we are aware of the fact that uh, Thailand is a very modern and uh, trend-setting food-producing country. The circular bioeconomy is a frontier uh, with a huge potential, and we are very interested in sharing experiences uh, about unlocking those potentials. That is also why we last year it was decided to increase uh, the cap capacity at the Danish Embassy on the Green Agenda in, uh, in Bangkok. So, since both our countries are front runners in sustainable food production, my aim today is to share my thoughts on how to make the next steps available and how we can show uh, the way forward. The points that uh, I hope you will take uh, with you away from my short presentation today is about uh, how to create uh, the best framework for cooperation and um, can design the game changing processes. So seen from a ministerial point of view, the circular bioeconomy can deliver towards uh, several sustainable development goals and uh, make sustainable sustainability and growth go hand in hand. But what is actually the government's role in circular bioeconomy and how can we contribute towards it? That is a challenge. So, the challenges within the circular bioeconomy is uh, is that it is rather complicated. As you see from this uh, slide, uh, and I'm sure you will hear it uh, several times during the next uh, couple of days, it, it, uh, there are many things that are complicated with taking the next steps within circular bioeconomy. First of all, it involves many ministries and many business areas to make these new value chains available. And often technologies are not competitive compared to uh, to the conventional technologies. 
Thirdly, externalities are not rewarded always by market or embedded in regulation. And a lack of level playing field between conventional and bio-based products is a challenge. Oops. Um, so, and uh, uh, another example is that the biomass uh, use can be locked in existing, existing value chains, which makes it uh, difficult to move the biomass resources to new and, and, uh, and more sustainable value chains. So, all these challenges cannot be solved by governments alone. I will give a few examples on how we in Denmark is, is trying to, uh, to solve these uh, issues. First of my first example is uh, the National Bioeconomy Panel. The, the, the government um, constituted this panel uh, several years ago and gave it the task to give advice to the, to the Danish government on how to establish new sustainable bioeconomy value chains. The panel is given a task each year. It's supported by a secretariat and it's provided with funds to carry out strategic analysis and background papers. And the recommendations must contribute to a double or triple bottom line. So both economy creation of jobs and have positive impacts on climate and the environment. On the next slide, you will see um, the key elements of uh, the terms of reference for the bioeconomy panel. So you see a clear demand for double or triple uh, bottom line. So, the bioeconomy is, con is con um, consists of 18 members uh, from both academia, companies, NGOs, unions, and business associations. So, but in order to get insights of the concrete value chains that the, the panel is working on, uh, there is set down um, a business group that advises the panel. Of course, uh, uh, there's a ministerial steering group and there's a cross ministerial secretariat in the secretariat and in the steering group, several ministries are uh, represented here. In this case, we have climate, energy, business and growth, environment, research and education. And the Ministry of Food, Agriculture and Fisheries is chairing um, the panel. Or oh, the oh, sorry, that, not the panel, but the, the steering group and the secretariat. The protein agenda was the first topic that the panel uh, has worked on. Uh, and in June 2018, uh, the panel handed in recommendations to the government on the proteins for the future. In October, uh, the Danish ministry responded by publishing a, a protein action plan. In fact, this this arrangement with, prom with, with promising the panel to, to answer and to uh, give feedback and publish an uh, action plan has proven to be a very good concept because it makes it more interesting uh, for the panel members to invest uh, their time in, uh, in, in advising the government. Next slide. So here you see it, an example of how the, the panel worked on uh, the protein agenda. The, the key point to take away here is that it's very important to to have focus on full value chains, look at all the technologies available uh, for, for refining uh, biomass uh, potential, and look at all the uh, relevant uh, product areas. Now let's move to another example. That is the Green Development and Demonstration Program. So th this program was started back in 2010 when the, uh, when the law came in, into force. And the aim was to promote a green transition of the Danish food sector. Uh, the, GO, the GUDP covers the, the whole value chain from primary production over food processing to retail. And we have projects covering each area such as plant and animal production, energy production, and food processing. The budget has varied a bit over the years, but approximately we have 30 million US dollars per year. And in some years, there are additional funds for specific topics such as uh, the climate, organic farming, or the protein uh, protein production. In fact, we also have these development and demonstration programs for other sectors. We have one for the for energy technology and one for environmental technology. Since the start in 2010, 
uh, the, the program has funded uh, more than 500 projects with a total of approximately 400 million US dollars. The beneficiaries of the program are farmers, fishermen, enterprises, organizations, researchers, universities, and we have two application rounds per year, one in the beginning of the year and one in the middle of the year. And it is, it's led by a professional board and members are appointed uh, from the business community and represent the food, agriculture and fishing industry. The program is designed to motivate uh, the applicants to cooperate in order to ensure growth and at the same time address crucial challenges facing society. The program, the program has defined the challenges and the applicants are to find the required solutions. There's a strong focus on the double bottom line, which means that all projects must demonstrate effects, both on the environment, sustainability and economic sustainability. Every applica application must quantify the foreseen effects of the project and all applications must present a business plan documenting how the desired outcomes and impacts will be achieved. As a development and demonstration program, our main focus is on activities within these fields. However, we also found research activities that are fund research activities when research is necessary in order to accomplish development uh, projects. So here you see the spider web. Um, and the program uh, defined the challenges and when applicants provide the idea of a solution, they must quantify the foreseen effects with a focus on the double or bottom line. This is the spider web. It shows the six criteria that are used to prioritize the applications. It contains six criteria where four are about green sustainability and two are about economic sustainability. All projects need to demonstrate effects on both the sides, economic and green development, but there's no demand for a project to have effects on all criteria, but it must have effects on both sides of the spider web. On the next slide, you can see what kind of project that has been funded over the past years. You see here how it is, um, um, how projects has been de divided between several uh, uh, various sectors. Plant production has been the most strongly represented primary production since 2015, and the share increased once again in 2020. Plant projects made out, made up the uh, 37 percent of last year's projects. The share of livestock projects has also increased slightly. Um, after a decline in 2019. In practice, we have seen that the cooperation between the, the panel, uh, as I mentioned earlier, and the green uh, development and demonstration program has been very good. That is uh, seen in the way that the, uh, the recommendations from the panel has often been followed up by concrete uh, projects within the, the development and demonstration programs. One example of that is uh, is the protein agenda where we have funded uh, uh, protein uh, biorefineries um, that deliver on the recommendations from the bioeconomy panel. So my main takeaways from this very short presentation is that it's uh, very important to invest a lot of time uh, and, and, uh, and resources in, in the cross-sectorial and ministerial uh, cooperation. And it's very important to, to, um, to design processes that allow for bottom-up processes and you can uh, you need and listen to competences from different areas. We also see that the, the demand that the expectation of uh, creating double bottom lines has worked really well in practice and uh, forcing the the applicants and the and the, the yeah the applicants to to think of um, all the effects. And finally it's very important to look uh, look ahead and and see what challenges that come up in the horizon and and to have a focus on on uh, on projects that can deliver on the long term goals thank you very much for your time and uh, please don't hesitate to get back to me or colleagues from the ministry thank you thank you very much mr Nobel, for sharing your view with us especially from the perspective point of view of get governmental sectors 
And actually, I look quickly in the chat box. There are some participants show their interest to connect with the state of green. So we will collect those contact addresses and submit them to Royal Thai Embassy in Copenhagen and, of course, the state of green later. So the next speaker is Mr. Thomas Thors, Mayor of the Regional Municipality of Bornholm. He will give a talk on Bornholm's ambition as the first West Free Island in 2032, the role of local government in Denmark's green and circular transition. Please welcome Mr. Thomas Tors. Thank you so much. It's a great pleasure to me to be able to address you all today. As mayor of the regional municipality of Bornholm, I'm extremely proud of us setting out to become the first waste-free island in uh, 2032. Our experiences and way forward can, it is hoped, provide inspiration for Denmark's green and circular transition, but also beyond. A word about my municipality. Bornholm is an island located in, in this little corner of the world. Bornholm is in the Baltic Sea at a crossroads between Denmark to the west, Sweden to the north, and Germany and Poland to the south. We are connected to the rest of Denmark by a ferry link to Copenhagen and to Sweden at a point with just within distance to Copenhagen. Next, please. The, yeah are some distinguishing factors about Bornholm, which is also known as the Sunshine Island. What you can see on the picture is the town of Gudjem, a charming and picturesque former fishing village. We have a waste management authority and service provider under direct control of the municipality named Bofa while waste and wastewater are handled by a few public utility companies such as Beof and RVV. Both sectors naturally have a big role to pay, uh, play in our green transition. As you can see, we are approximately 40,000 inhabitants. We have every year uh, about half a million visitors to Bornholm. Next. Here you can see uh, the concrete, what we are looking at, at hit by 2032. Bofa runs physical waste infrastructure, including the island's waste incineration plant, which is seen on this picture. As you also can see, the waste incineration plant is set to be decommissioned by 2032. By this time, the plant will have economically been, been paid off, and no further waste incineration investments are forthcoming. Instead, the Municipality Council has provided a unanimous backing for Bornholm to show the way without waste in 2032. This is our vision, which ensures that by uh, 2032, all waste on Bornholm is prevented or 100% uh, reused or recycled. Currently, 69% uh, to 70% of waste is sent for recycling. 20 to 25% uh, is incinerated, and 6 to 7% is landfill. Since Bonholm is, uh, to some extent, a tourist economy, I chose I've chosen here to narrow a bit on this sector. Hopefully, what we see going on with respect to circular economy can be transferable to islands in Thailand that share some of our characteristics. As we recover from the COVID-19 pandemic, the tourism industry is set to bounce back and this could be seen as an opportunity to really push forward with a circular economy and zero waste agenda in islands. We see here, next please, we see here 
Bonn has already a green uh, destination, is already a green destination. Certification schemes such as Green Key are used by some of our major hotels. Green Solution House, as you can see at the picture, itself is a lighthouse project, a champion hotel with green and circular solution implemented throughout. Organic food and solar panels are some of the solutions used, as well as allowing green areas to grow naturally to improve biodiversity. There are some noteworthy projects within the sector. Sustainable Restaurants is a project led by the Bonhomian Agriculture and Food Council and aims to get more restaurants included in formal green schemes. Uh, Greater Bio uh, includes both as participation and aims to test social uh, solutions for food waste, enabling it to enter the Biogas plan for energy and fertilizer production. Sustainable bottom line uh, Bornholm is a project that helps small and medium sized enterprises with energy and waste audits and improvements, including, for example, camping grounds. Next, please. <laughs> uh, interesting, uh, Bornholm has been uh, its best tourist uh, season ever despite the COVID-19 pandemic, since international travel for Danes was restricted. An interesting set of channels, ch challenges was seen last summer. Face marks were seen uh, deposited everywhere except where they should be deposited. You can look at the picture. Uh, we have to com uh, communicate to citizens through the media to address this, uh, this problem. Since restaurants visits has been restricted, there was a search in takeaway pack uh, packaging waste. This provided ample fuel for our waste incineration plant, but it was not really a sustainable solution in the long run. As a mayor, I, of course, uh, please present the political governance uh, system of Bornholm. I will here say a few things about our role as policymakers in our democratic tradition. Next, please. One of the pleasures we have as elected, uh, elected politician is showing the leadership needed to achieving zero waste. This picture is from our council hall during the COVID pandemic, but before full lockdown. We are slowly getting back to usual business now. The best example of leadership is how the vision came about. Unanimous support was provided to the vision from the whole political spectrum. Another example is moving from a basic household waste collection system to one that is much more refined and aligns with national policy, minimum 10 fractions. Bonholm was proud to be the recipient uh, of, 20, uh, of the 2019 Responsible Island Prize via the European Union, which brought up with a lump sum of funds to support local green projects. Finally, we show political uh, leadership by thinking innovatively about working with citizens, stimulating technological, uh, technological development and fostering new partnerships across sectors. In this respect, we are honored to be partnering with the Danish Foreign uh, Minister of Foreign Affairs. Finally, one of the most important things that the political structure can do for a green transition is create the necessary frameworks for things to happen. We have all we have an overall bright green island strategy on Bornholm, which ensures that we progress in alignment with the sustainable development goals. We have, of course, our zero waste vision. We also have adopted a policy to be entirely fossil free by 2040. And by the way, Bonholm has been pinpointed 
as an energy island, as our ambassador mentioned, uh, of strategic importance for uh, Danish energy infrastructure development. And we have decided recently to push ahead with a green mobility strategy. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Tors, for your informative presentation. It is certainly inspiring to learn how the local governments, such as Bornholm, could do so much for the environment as well as the eco economy of the community. Thank you again. And the next speaker is Mr. Jan Lawson, Director of Trade and Market Relations, Danish Agriculture and Food Council. Today, he will give a talk on the circular bioeconomy in the Danish food cluster, how Danish private sector embraces new business opportunities and tackle climate challenges. Please welcome Mr. Lawson. Excellencies, uh, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon to those of you joining from, from Thailand and good morning to those uh, joining from, from Denmark or elsewhere in Europe. Thank you very much for the invitation for, for this webinar. And may I also use this opportunity to congratulate all of us with the 400 years of excellent friendship and partnership and relations, uh, Thailand and Denmark between. Well, I'm representing the private sector. Uh, you've heard uh, representatives from uh, public private partnerships and, and the government sector. Now I will try to give you an angle from the private sector and more specifically from the agriculture and food cluster. And today we actually focus on the uh, opportunities, but of course, uh, you have to be honest, there's also some headaches and some difficulties and some pressure on, on agriculture and food in order to deliver up to the expectations. But let's focus on the opportunities. I will uh, have a strong platform uh, as the one I would uh, mention to you. Uh, in our organization, we cover uh, membership from uh, just about everybody in the agriculture and food sector. They don't have to be members. They are, of course, they are voluntarily. And we don't have the integration in the value chain economically. So it's more like cooperation within the value chain. So what we are doing between the farmers, the food industry and the agro uh, industrial sector and even the food tech sector is to see what opportunities can we achieve together how can we cooperate and make it a stronger chain? And of course, being also as a uh, business organization in Denmark, we are proud also to be a member of State of Green, which is uh, actually hosting the studio today. What I would like to mention is our mindset uh, set and approach to all this. Uh, we are a very small uh, country and just a few characteristics. We are tiny, only 5.5 million uh, people living here and not many natural resources, but one of our resources is fertile soil. So we are actually uh, cultivating 60% of our area in Denmark. And that comes with responsibility and how we actually do that with acceptance from society. And there we have the drivers for what we're doing. We have to be sustainable in what we do. We have to be focusing on climate. And as we have production for three times our own population and food, we export 70% of our production. You know that also in Thailand. We need to focus on what the international market wants, what they expect from us. And what they want is typically more quality and higher value for the products. So we have to work very close together in the value chain in reaching that. And we do that via our innovation center, SIGIS, uh, which is part of our organization, and also the advisory services that are able to implement quickly the new kind of knowledge, the new kind of innovation that we achieve. And the advisory services is also in the hands of the farmers organization. So we are able to, within the value chain, to optimize and reach better results. Of course, we need very, very close uh, relationship and investments in research and development. And we do need the public uh, private partnerships, just as mentioned here on uh, State of Green and others also in other areas. This is perhaps uh, quite easy to set up, uh, better use of resources, actually better economy and makes new opportunities. I think it's, it's a common uh, truth that that's the situation. If you reduce the, uh, the, the use of resources, you will uh, have a less uh, costs 
and you would be able to perhaps have a better economy, new business opportunities. What we do is, is to have different ways of doing that. We are trying to reduce the waste from our production. So we have as much as possible actually integrated in production or finding new ways or new uh, outlets for the products. We recycle a lot of products, water, nutrients, whatever. We develop the side streams from products, productions. Typically, side streams can become uh, perhaps even more valuable than the main kind of production. And we should perhaps use our imagination and inspire each other and be uh, innovative and, and create a new business of ventures. And then just now the biomass production is extremely important how we actually increase that and we get uh, the, the kind of green proteins that we need for our production. What the uh, ambassadors to, to, to Thailand, the Danish ambassador to Thailand mentioned is that we also focus on more with less. We would like to reduce the input and re uh, increase the outputs. I tend to be a little bit, uh, perhaps a little bit rude in saying that could also be like a sustainable intensification. Because we all know that we need to be sustainable in what we're doing. That's a prerequisite. And we also need to, to focus very much on, on using the resources, resources uh, to, in, in an intelligent way. So more circular and more resource efficient. But we also would like to have a smaller impact on the environment, on climate and surroundings. We would like to be friends with our neighbors, so we would be able to, to stand up for what we're doing. So doing that, you could have a lot of costs on your production, but, but you should be able to remain competitive. You're also a trading nation in Thailand, and we are very much a trading nation in Denmark. So what we're trying to do is get the higher yields and increased uh, efficiency in what we're doing, but still maintaining the sustainability, thus uh, creating more value. But of course, you need to tell everybody to see exactly how you're doing your production and what you're doing. And then looking at the kind of markets which are ready and able to actually pay the kind of higher price. You have to be honest, this is not for everybody because there will be a higher cost for the products. And that leads also to a lot of new partnerships and alliances. Otherwise, you would not be able to, to actually maintain or even create the new business opportunities. Coming a little bit in on, on the climate issues, uh, uh, our vision in our organization, uh, being a private organization, we two years ago uh, said that our vision was to become climate neutral uh, in agriculture and food by 2050. Uh, that is also followed by some of our bigger members within the pork and the dairy sector, which are the biggest sectors in, in, in Danish agriculture. And it's also like, followed up by a lot of uh, initiatives uh, coming from the European Union, coming from the Danish government. But we have our own uh, vision and of course we need to live up to all the expectations. What we need is a lot of innovation, a lot of partnerships, a lot of research and development because we cannot do this alone. I think uh, someone mentioned from our organization that, that we know uh, just about half of where uh, the knowledge we need to, to get there. And the rest we need to do in partnerships via new research and development, and also look at, at what kind of uh, uh, regulatory uh, activities we need, but also having the stability so you can have uh, the kind of investments needed for the future development. And what we do in, in, in our sectors, of course, look at every element in the value chain that comes in the farm uh, area, on, on the, in the fields and in the stables, how we use our nutrients, how we use our uh, waste products, uh, especially on, on manure, of course, you can uh, uh, reuse or circulate it in, in, in uh, the circular economy. You can also use it for, for energy purposes. Uh, and, and then we try also in the processing and, and, and every link or every element in the value chain, we try to optimize. So just to sum up, we uh, are focusing on the sustainable development goals, not just uh, the climate issues, not just on the circular bioeconomy, but of course that are very, very element, important elements. So, so we are trying to optimize within every part of the sustainable development goals. And we do hope that we can be a, a strong partner also internationally to inspire and innovate together. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Mr. Lawson for the interesting presentation on food and agriculture, which is also one of important sectors of Thai economy. We can see clearly that this should be one of the areas that Thailand and Denmark should explore 
the collaboration. Now we we'll move to the next speaker, Mr. Ufer Jokensen, the director of Aarhus University Center for Circular Bioeconomy. And today he will give a talk on interdisciplinary research as a key to unlock Danish bioeconomy's full potential. Please welcome Mr. Ufer Jokensen. And uh, thank you for inviting me to this prestigious uh, event uh, between our two countries. And I hope we can uh, develop our also cooperation within the research. I will uh, show some examples of how interdisciplinary research can help unlock uh, the full potential of the bioeconomy. Uh, this is research in the whole area of the bioeconomy from resources from the sea and from land integrated with uh, research on engineering science, chemistry, etc. There are great expectations to the bioeconomy, as you can see here, to take over from the fossil economy that we have been uh, become so dependent of over the last century. And I think this uh, graph is a bit optimistic, but it is a big challenge uh, to take over from the fossil economy and develop all of the products that we now have from oil uh, to come from, from bioproducts. And this certainly needs research to, uh, to fulfill that challenge. Uh, the EU Commission has prepared strategies on how to come there. Uh, the last one from uh, 2018 uh, stresses that all of the uh, revenues and the many new jobs that we can create uh, is dependent on research to unlock the full potential. Before we go into uh, how to do that, I would like to cite this old guy that we cannot solve our problems with the same thinking we used when we created them. This is why uh, our university, our university has created uh, thematical centers within some of our global challenge areas where we uh, are going to work uh, very interdisciplinary. And it is uh, centers covering uh, areas like water technology, digitiz uh, digitization, climate, etc. I'm heading the uh, Center on Circular Bioeconomy, uh, CBIO. CBIO is um, constructed of seven research pillars, and you can see how they uh, span from agriculture and, and sea uh, resources uh, across also food science and feed science into biomaterials uh, and bio oils. And you can also see here uh, specific persons that you may contact if you want to cooperate on specific issues. One of our main uh, missions uh, in the center is to cover our what we think are unique research platforms um, and make interdisciplinary research over the, the full production circle. And we have state of the art uh, research facilities on, on full scale um, farm field uh, experiments uh, on more than 100 uh, hectares. Now we also have that on, on the sea. We have 25 hectares of experimental areas on the sea, which is quite new for Denmark. I think you are more experienced on that in, in Asia. For some reason, we haven't explored that part of our resources in Denmark so much before. And then we have uh, what we call uh, uh, the world largest uh, biogas experimental facility. And of course, we have state-of-art uh, lab facilities. Some of the Danish societal challenges that we are going to address and hopefully uh, help to solve are that we seem to be able to phase out fossil fuels by 2050, as already pointed out by earlier presentation. But it's quite important that some of the renewable energy has to come from biomass. And do we have enough biomass resources to cover that? We, ne we need also to find alternatives to oil by Oil-based uh, oil chemicals and materials for uh, packaging, for example. 
we have a problem uh, with our quite large import of soy protein from uh, another continent, other continents of the world uh, that are feeding our big animal industry. It makes us dependent on this resource, and it's also a source of a protein that is environmentally challenged. And this agriculture in general is challenged to meet uh, national and EU policies on environment and climate, and it's a big uh, travel uh, to get there to become a uh, hundred percent uh, climate neutral. One example of uh, the research we are uh, doing, uh, interdisciplinary research, is the uh, green biorefinery of, of crops where we, uh, instead of mature crops, takes green crops. We are mainly focusing on grass and clovers, legumes, but we have also processed uh, cassava. This was from Ghana. I know cassava is also a big crop in, in Thailand. Uh, and uh, virtually all green material can be processed in this uh, uh, demonstration platform. We have moved from um, the lab across pilot to now demonstration scale uh, more than, in, in less than 10 years. And we are quite proud of the products that we can produce from this uh, platform, highly uh, controlled uh, processing facilities, uh, which we can also report the results from. Uh, example uh, of the input uh, for this in power refinery, uh, we have shown in our agricultural experiments that we can double uh, productivity in Danish agriculture by changing from some of the normal crop rotations with cereals into grass or maybe uh, maize production that are green crops that can be processed in the green biorefinery. We have also looked at and the other uh, side of the coin, the nitrate leaching, one of the important environmental parameters uh, for Denmark. And it shows that uh, grass that is double productivity and more than half uh, nitrate leaching compared uh, to the normal crop rotation. And there, uh, maize is, uh, is not the most competitive uh, crop because it has a very high nitrate leaching. One of the uh, main uh, products that we are producing uh, from the green biorefinery is a uh, protein concentrate that can substitute uh, uh, some of the imports of uh, soy. And we have uh, at uh, feeding experiments uh, to many different uh, animal types. And uh, the short, short story is that uh, or all the results are positive and we can now start um, substituting some of the soil. And um, we are quite uh, proud that it seems that this research has uh, ported, paved the way for market introduction. There are, uh, this year, two commercial uh, um, constructions that are going uh, into production. And uh, it will be very interesting to see how that works out during this year. Uh, they have been supported from uh, public uh, funding as uh, presented by Espen Norberg earlier. GODP has supported this first commercial action. It's very important to support this uh, travel uh, across the Valley of Death from uh, research into commercial production. We have focused in the beginning on uh, producing these animal feed fractions uh, from the green biorefinery. And uh, these are the arrows here in the middle where you can see this is already now existing. Reduce uh, feed for monogastric and uh, polygastric animals. And then we have a uh, side stream go to biogas and we return the nutrients to the field uh, in a circular way. We are now uh, looking very much into also producing human food directly from uh, grasses and clovers and also producing biochemicals and materials for packaging uh, and many other uh, chemicals uh, and also uh, things to use in the pharmaceutical industry, for example. 
can also treat biomass from the sea uh, in the biorefinery, and we have uh, a project uh, focusing on on different uh, algae, macroalgae from uh, the sea, and to see if we can make functional food proteins from from this. Other um, technology that we have a full scale demonstration facility is on hydrothermal liquefaction producing oils for jet fuel binders and other materials it can process a lot of different uh, biomass types and uh, one of the successes from this research is that uh, have been, uh, two patents filed uh, to produce a bio-based binder that um, company rock rule has uh, bought into and uh, to produce an alternative to their current uh, fossil based binders. Finally, um, a few words on the biogas. This is a very important technology to uh, uh, process side streams from the from the uh, refineries uh, into bioenergy and fertilizer. We have uh, research facilities from one to uh, 1.2 million liters. And we also work uh, with unique uh, CO2 operating facilities in order to transfer the CO2 part of the gas into methane using some of our surplus power from wind and solar when there's too much of it. We have produced some scenarios on how to uh, increase the production of biogas in Denmark from the 17 petajoule that we uh, used in 2019. We can uh, increase a lot, uh, but it depends a lot on both technology and how much biomass we can produce by sustainable intensification, for example. And we can even go to uh, maybe 100 uh, petajoule in the most optimistic scenario. So, sum up, uh, I will say that shifting from the fossil era to the bioeconomic era is not just usual business. It takes a lot to establish a new industry, substitute fossil one, and at the same time to disrupt agriculture. These are enormous tasks that demands for mega investments and new partnerships. And I hope we can also make a partnership uh, with my uh, research. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Mr. Jokinson. I can very much relate to your task as the agency I represent. Uh, National Science and Technology Development Agency, or NASDA, is one of the key drivers in R&D for biocircular green economy in Thailand. And it is very timely because our next speaker is the president of NASDA, Dr. Narong Sidilert Warakun. He will give a talk on an overview of the biocircular green economy model Thailand's new sustainable growth engine and national development agenda. So please welcome Dr. Narong. Good morning and good afternoon to audience in Europe and Thailand. I'm delighted to have an opportunity to introduce Thailand's new national agenda, Biocircular Green Economy or BCG, and its strategic plan. Our BCG economy models aim at applying the concept of bioeconomy, circular economies, and green economies to the national development. We are applying bioeconomy concept to create additional value to natural and biological resources as well as farm commodities. Applying circular concept to keep resources in use for as long as possible through reuse and recycling. Employing green economy to increase resource use efficiency while reducing environment risk. In this slide, I would like to mention some of the main strengths and challenges of Thailand. Our strength includes listeners in biological, cultural and geographical diversity. With the biodiversity, we are ranked on the 15 among 193 countries around the world. Other than that, 
ECT industry in Thailand contribute about 3.4 trillion Thai baht, or about one-fifth of our GDP, and account for 16.5 million jobs around the country. Among our challenges are environmental degradation, climate change, low economic growth, low technological self-reliance, and low income. BCG model, therefore, aimed at creating self-reliance, building resilience, and expanding recovery from the pandemic. It intends to utilize science, technology, and innovation to drive the national development, focusing on conservation, utilization, and management, as well as value creation of biological and cultural diversity. In terms of vision, a five-year BCT strategic plan set a vision for Thailand to attain sustainable economic growth with science, technology, and innovation. The plan consists of four areas, as you can see. The first one to promote sustainability of natural and biological resources through balancing conservation and utilization. Second, strengthen communities and grassroots economies. Third one is enhance sustainable competitiveness of BCT industry, and of course, build resilience to global changes. BCT strategic plan has three goals, each which a set of key permanent indicators. Goal number one, to achieve sustainable economic growth and rise per capita income, BCT model is expected to less economic value of the BCT industry, increase high value products and services, generate more income and reduce social disparity among the grassroots. Goal number two, to promote human security in food, health and energy. BCT model aims to increase proportion of renewable energy consumption to 20% and improve across uh, and improve access to medicine and medical supplies even in crisis. Goal number three, to attain sustainability of resources and environment. BCG model will reduce natural resources consumption by two thirds, restore natural resources and promote sustainable tourism. In this slide, BCG model targets six areas, namely biological and cultural diversity, agriculture and food, medical and wellness, energy, material and biochemicals, tourism and creative economy, and of course, circular economies. Action plans had been designed for each strategic area. As you can see, there are several plans under each of the strategy. For sustainability of natural and biological resources, implementation plan is in place to strike a balance of conservation and utilization, build capacity in resource management, and establish a resource management system. For the second strategy, we will focus on improving food, health and energy security, facilitating area-based development, and making knowledge and technology more accessible to the grassroots people. For the third one, in order to enhance sustainability competitiveness of Thai industry, action plans include sectoral development, and address multiple components to drive business and industry, such as talent and entrepreneur market, regulatory framework, and infrastructure. And for the last strategy, we will be promoting frontier research, capacity building, and international partnership to build resilience to global changes. BCG roadmap consists of three phases. 
because it's vital to build a solid groundwork. A lot of tasks need to be achieved within the first two years. Task lending form, establishing awareness and understanding of VCT economy among all sectors to get their involvement. Preparing comprehensive database is of some laws and regulations, preparing infrastructure and manpower, developing program dealing with major issues such as single use plastics, antibiotics and chemical use in agriculture. Strengthening a dynamic economics all needs to be done during this phase. The following three phase, you know, the following three years are referred as the second phase. This year will be devoted to scale up action and strengthening industrial through R&D, entrepreneurship program and marketing. The last phase from 2026 to 2027 we we'll focus on expanding our products and services to global market, scaling up sustainable production and consumption actions, to investing in frontier research infrastructure. In summary, this is a checklist of nine things we need to work on. Ranging form, regulatory framework, infrastructure and facilities, frontier research, building new S-curve industry, improved market access, and of course, community development. BCT economy models involve all sectors in the society, including public, private, academic, and research, community and international alliance, Therefore, a structure and mechanism are set in place for administration as well as monitoring and evaluation. Three levels of committees have been set up to oversee the BCT implementation. This consists of the BCT policy board, which is chaired by the prime minister, the BCT implementation committee, which is chaired by the Minister of Higher Education, Research and Innovation, the BC subcommittee for its specific sector. The performance will be evaluated based on output, outcome, and impact of its action plan. I would like to end my talk with an open invitation for collaboration to Danish enterprises in the public and private domain. Thailand has a lot to offer to build a successful partnership for sustainability. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Dr. Narong, for your presentation. The next speaker from Thai side is Dr. Kantana Wanishikon, the Vice President of the Office of the National Higher Education, Science Research and Innovation Policy Council. And her talk will be on Thailand's Roadmap for Circular Economy. Dr. Gantana, the floor is yours. Good morning, our audience in Europe and good afternoon, audience in Thailand. First of all, I would like to thank the host very much for uh, inviting me to join the forum today uh, to share our, our work and exchange experiences in designing Thailand Circular Economy Roadmap. Uh, I have to say that this is a living document, uh, meaning that uh, we welcome input, suggestion, and comments uh, to revise it to make it uh, very strategic and practical. Uh, as Dr. Nerong has just mentioned to you, uh, the BCG model, uh, that uh, circular economy is uh, the cross-cutting foundation of the model meaning that when we uh, designing this uh, value creation in different products, services in different sector, uh, we encourage uh, stakeholders to also incorporate the concept of circularity or circular economy into uh, the design and development. For the guiding principle, uh, this is the inputs from discussion from uh, stakeholders 
we see circular economy as uh, solutions for both existing problem and also provide opportunities for new economy. Uh, as uh, you see in this figure, uh, companies or you know agencies would uh, you know force with this concept of green, uh, more resource efficiency, minimizing waste. Uh, so uh, this progression in linear economy development is uh, it's, it's, it's ongoing. But uh, in the policy design, we look for intervention points or uh, a, a pivotal point that we could help accelerate this uh, uh, concept of circularity while uh, going on with the waste minimization, but also looking at new economic opportunities. So there are key suggestions from different stakeholders. Uh, for example, uh, for accelerating Solving the solution of existing problem, there are requests on resource recycling, material flow analysis, uh, promotion of industry symbiosis, and waste sorting. While uh, for business uh, opportunities and uh, the new design for circular economy, a concept like a uh, circular design platform, a new uh, business model, uh, you know, like leasing model, and also developing sharing platform. Uh, a uh, key intervention point that was requested from our uh, stakeholders. So with that, we have come up with a uh, circular economy development framework. These are the key building blocks in the policy designs. And uh, as, as you know, we, we can only improve if we know what to measure. So we start with uh, three key KPIs or uh, key results that we would like to monitor. First is on the reduction in the use of primary raw materials by one fourth. Uh, this is a uh, five year plans and also reduction of greenhouse gas uh, by uh, 10 metric tons carbon dioxide equivalent. And also we are looking for uh, generating economic value for about uh, one to 3% of our GDP. So uh, um, this picture is sort of a simplified version of uh, what we are working on at the moment. So uh, we are looking at uh, target into a targeted intervention, uh, which we might need a, a regulatory sandbox to help accelerate this. Uh, for example, we are looking for a, a waste symbiosis. We have heard uh, from our speaker from Denmark that uh, Denmark has uh, done a lot of this uh, reverse logistics recycle. Uh, circular food waste and platform for green construction and smart city. Uh, you know, as uh, construction and food sectors are a key contributor to our waste uh, profile in Thailand. So here are the key uh, for uh, intervention that we are looking at. I'll go into more detail later. But also, we also look for opportunity for new economy. So there are requests for circular economy solution platform. Uh, including technology solution management uh, application ecosystem matchmaking uh, supply and demand. We, uh, they are looking for uh, service providers also helping with the standards and uh, different uh, designing business model. And also we should promote entrepreneurs, uh, startups to help you know closing the loop and developing new value chain. Uh, Along with targeted uh, intervention, which I will uh, go into the detail later, we also are working on uh, general uh, supporting in or enabling factors such as capacity building, cooperative platform, R&D program, uh, regulations and incentives. Uh, Dr. Nero has mentioned a lot about this uh, in its uh, previous session and also investment options and also promote uh, market opportunities and exports. So uh, with that uh, building block, we come up with um, uh, this year uh, circular economy anchor programs by the Ministry of Higher Education Science Research Innovation with uh, funding from uh, Science Research Innovation Fund, uh, which you'll hear more on uh, on the second uh, of June. Uh, Dr. Siri will also facilitate a discussion uh, on uh, this uh, collaboration and this uh, that can leverage on this platform. So uh, while we are working on uh, national vision and framework, uh, and also focus sector. We have promoted a uh, program, uh, this uh, four, five programs here, uh, the circular economy champion 
we uh, also uh, look at uh, circular economy showcase. A number of private sector have already uh, 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 launched a lot of initiative on uh, you know support uh, this high impact initiative. For example, recycle plastic, uh, take back model, uh, closed loop business. So uh, uh, we're looking for uh, enterprise with clear uh, circular economy agenda can apply for this program. Uh, on circular economy platform, we uh, support uh, companies or universities that uh, develop a solution platform for uh, key players, uh, companies that interested in converting their uh, business model into a circular model. Also, uh, entrepreneurs also welcome to apply for this program. And also a circular economy research and development program for R&D activities focusing on enabling technology uh, and uh, example activities uh, such as developing nat national material flow database or agricultural based uh, management and database. Uh, and last but not least is on uh, citizens uh, promoting awareness and mindset and also create market for circular economy product. Uh, this program also uh, open for international partnership on a global partnership program. Uh, I would like to uh, spend the rest of my time here, um, about a few minutes left, with uh, the sandbox program that we are developing, and we are uh, welcome uh, international partners to um, join this, uh, also other, our Thai partner as well. We are uh, supporting this uh, sandbox on waste biosis as you know that uh, industrial waste from one location can be uh, resources uh, input from another uh, companies or enterprise. And uh, there are a number of uh, legal restriction on this. Uh, so we are uh, discussing with industrial estate and companies in uh, developing sandbox on this uh, developing system of exchange waste uh, uh, from uh, industrial eco -tile. Uh, uh, at the moment, we also look at uh, sector level where uh, you know the whole value chain is applied for our best symbiosis. Uh, another sandbox that we are packaging with partners is on uh, reverse logistics and recycle. Uh, our colleagues from Denmark are probably very uh, familiar with this, but in Thailand, uh, there's a number of hurdles, a number of uh, things that we have to overcome in uh, take bags, in particular a plastic take bag. So we are working with a brand owner in developing a reverse logistic recycle and also uh, unlock some of the rules and regulation uh, to help uh, with uh, this uh, take, take back program, including uh, uh, exploring funding mechanism uh, for this activity as well. Uh, another thing is I've heard from our speaker from Denmark on uh, circular food waste. Uh, perhaps this is another area that we can also share experience and learn from experience from our colleague in Denmark is on uh, uh, circular food waste. Uh, um, I just got an idea that uh, energy could be another option uh, in addition to what we have uh, highlighted here that uh, a high quality food can uh, be donated uh, and also locally for uh, animal feed, but also for uh, energy uh, uh, use as well. Uh, uh, last but not least on this, this sandbox program that we are working on is on construction and smart cities. Uh, we promote uh, this modular construction and material designs and uh, uh, to help with uh, promotion of using secondary use material. And a number of R&D program uh, on, on this has been uh, supported already. So this is another area that uh, we work with uh, construction sector in developing this innovative construction designs uh, with environmental friendly uh, uh, and also planning, connecting all this, including the logistics. Uh, that's a very important part. Uh, I think I used up my time. But there are ongoing activities, initiatives that are uh, uh, also uh, on, uh, implemented. Uh, we have initiated Circular Economy Policy Forum. We'll have what, another forum on the second as well. Uh, all of you uh, uh, that are interested are welcome to join. 
uh, and here's some of the partners that have joined us on this policy forum to sharpen our policy design, this roadmap designs. Uh, we have a program on supply economy design platform uh, with uh, universities and research institution and also business accelerator. Uh, we are working with um, the federal Thai industry and their partners on uh, the circular economy standards, uh, voluntary EPR program, and also explore uh, whether we would need a circular economy promotion law. Um, uh, a number of enabling infrastructure and pilot program is has been uh, initiated. For example, a smart recycling city. And also, last but not least, is on regional and global partnership. Uh, Thailand will host an EPIC uh, uh, next year, and circular economy is one of the agenda that we will propose uh, for uh, uh, policy coordination and also a partnership. With that, I conclude my talk. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Kantina, for shedding some light on the direction of Thailand's circular economy plan. Now we have completed individual presentation and I would like to ask our speakers and invited guests to join the panel discussion session. We will discuss on how can different stakeholders, public, private, research and people work together effectively in the biocircular grid economy and what is a way forward for Thai-Danish collaboration in the BCG economy model. So our panelists are His Excellency Mr. Jon Tuopo, Ambassador of Denmark to Thailand, and all speakers who presented earlier. But to streak our time in, on our program, while we could cover all questions there are and have time to accept some questions from our audiences, I would like to ask our panelists to reply questions very briefly, using maybe one to two minutes per questions only. Thank you. Without further delay, may I start the first question. It is for State of Green, Mr. Mortensen. So Denmark has a strong tradition of collaboration between various stakeholders from the government authorities to research institutes and the private sector. How much does this collaborative DNA contribute to Denmark's success story today? Were there any policy or initiative in the past that helped foster such a collaborative environment? Something that could be a lesson for Thailand and other countries. Mr. Monizen, please. Thank you very much for that question. It's a very good question. I think uh, it, it could be a very long answer. The short answer is that we have an extremely long tradition in Denmark for public-private partnership. Um, we have a, a situation in Denmark, uh, also for decades, where the various partners, be it the labor unions, government, business, they don't see each other as enemies. We collaborate built on trust. And I would, my point would be that this uh, trust that has been built up over more than a century really uh, is a key explanation to the fact that we've gotten so far that we have today. Thank you. Thank you very much for the very enlightening uh, reply. So let us move to the second question, which is Mr. Which is for Mr. Norbert. So businesses, especially the SME, often associate going green and sustainable with the higher cost of production. And Denmark has an ambitious climate target and tough regulation when it comes to the environmental impact of food production. As the policymaker, how do you gain political support for tough regulations? How do you also convince businesses that the green and circular transition present new opportunities? Mr. Norbert, may I hear your thought on this, please? Mr. Norberg, you didn't have your mic on. Okay, you have your mic on now, please.
Um, okay, maybe I will go to the next questions for Mr. Lawson first. Sorry about that one. Maybe we come back to Mr. Novak again. So for the private sector's viewpoint, what kind of role of support do you expect from the government in order to help the Danish food cluster adapt to circular and green thinking? Mr. Lawson, please. Yes, please. Well, first of all, I, I think we um, are in a position where we'd like to see partnerships because uh, we have a, a situation in Denmark, as uh, mentioned by Mr. Mortensen, that but we have a very close cooperation in general. Uh, but we would like to see a combination of a market-driven kind of uh, economy and, and therefore also what is demanded from the marketplace. But we would also see some kind of partnership in developing and, and creating the opportunities for us actually to live up to what the market expects. So I think it's depending on, on where you are in, let's say, the, uh, the, the phase of a product uh, or a method or a process in general. because. You should have like like a initial kind of uh, introduction assistance, perhaps from the government side, and then you leave it for the marketplace to take over. That's what we've been doing for for energy uh, in many many years, and we can do that also for circular bioeconomy. We've seen examples of that also, and then gradually developing the marketplace and and the procedures. So that would be the approach: partnerships and developing together. Thank you. I think that's something that Thailand could learn from Denmark. Thank you very much. So the next question is for Mr. Jorgensen. And later, the same question will also be asked to the speaker from Thailand. So from the research community's viewpoint, what kind of role or support do you expect from the government to facilitate R&D other than funding? Also, how can we improve the collaboration between university and industries to ensure that research is put into practice? Mr. Jorgensen, please. I think again, I would like to point to uh, partnerships. Uh, we have a, a partnership on sustainable power refinery, uh, including uh, both academia, industries, and legal authorities. Um, also, uh, policy framework is extremely important uh, to facilitate uh, that uh, new uh, knowledge from uh, research is uh, converted into action. Because, uh, it's necessary that, uh, for example, the benefits uh, for the environment are, are put into economic terms as well. And there we have a lot of uh, help also from the European Union that uh, makes uh, legal frameworks for uh, carbon credits, etc. in the coming years. Also carbon credits also from, for agriculture, which is a new thing. That's great. Thank you so much. Uh, Dr. Narong, would you like to add any comments to this point? Yes, let me add on this point. Apart from the funding from the government, I think the government should pay more attention to the way to maximize the research and innovation utilization. In Thailand, we found that a lot of research work were not able to be implemented properly. There are so many reasons underneath these problems. For example, lacking effectiveness mechanism to link government sector, private sector, and research institute, as the uh, our colleague from Denmark has mentioned. And also in Thailand, we also lacking of the essential infrastructure. But I think the government need to set a clear policy and introduce some rules and regulation to address this issue. Thank you. Thank you very much. And Dr. Kantena, would you like to add something on this? Please have your mic on. Uh, for uh, partnerships, uh, first of all, I, I think we need to be focused. Uh, and we need to start with our strength, uh, identifying our strength, and uh, select our, uh, you know, based on that. And uh, on the partnership, I think there are di different ways of managing uh, collaboration, in particular uh, international collaboration uh, for, for uh, research and development. 
uh, you know, pretty competitive. I think that it's, it's easier to start. Um, university or research institution can uh, start with this and, uh, you know, government can come in and share funding. But once the collaboration is moved along to uh, technology innovation, I think the private sector should uh, take, take the lead. Uh, I also uh, echo Dr. Narong, uh suggestion on one thing that we could work together is on uh, infrastructure, uh, uh, sharing of infrastructures, and also um, uh, one of uh, our colleagues from Denmark is, I think, uh, the fundamental is policy and ecosystem. We really need uh, this uh, clear policy commitment from both sides and also um, incentive, appropriate incentive, uh, so that the collaboration would uh, sustain. Thank you. Thank you very much. So um, let's move to, move to the next question. May I ask Mr. Tors, um, because uh, we are also interested in the lo local government. Bonhomme vision to become the world's first free island in 2023 is very admirable. And can you share with us how to get people in the community on board with the government screen and circular projects? What are your tips on raising people's awareness on simple things like recycling? Mr. Tors? Yes. Thank you. It's not uh, 20, uh, 23, it's 32, in fact. Uh, Yes, it's true that uh, the local governments are very close to and even more so when it comes to Bornholm. Close to 100% of the workers live on Bornholm itself and go about their lives as citizens. And this is only reinforced, uh, reinforces the island's community uh, spirit that we have. But the municipalities in other parts of Denmark, civil servants commute across municipality boundaries to get work, they get to work, and there's a certain distance between the citizenry and uh, the bureaucracy. But uh, this is a bit different in our particular geography. We are all in the same boat. As well, we, there is a strong local Bornholm culture and identity. We have our own dialect, a long history of silver islands, and even a local version of the Danish flag. The, the people of Bornholm stays together. When it comes to our green and circular projects, the interesting thing we see is there is a high general level of environmental awareness in our population. And the Danish population in general, it's a relative easy to gain public support, for example, a higher level of household waste sorting, because the average Danish person is quite aware about their environmental footprint. While we are one of the societies in the world with the highest rate of consumption and waste generation, we also are quite aware that these things have to change. In uh, this respect, we often see the citizens push up for being more sustainable. And in this respect, we are more than happy to oblige. As for a tip, we have good experiments, uh, experiments uh, partnering with companies and the media to getting certain messages across. Last summer, for example, our waste collectors had puncture wounds injured by tourists who was not careful about that they threw in their waste plastic bags, for example, uh, barbecue skewers. So we applied to the public to be more careful and this had a positive effect. We have a near, near uh, yeah, about this. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Tors. Um, so actually, there are a list of questions that I would like to ask more, but due to the time limitation, I will have to go to my final questions before going to the question from audiences. Um, the question is for all of speaker and the guests. Uh, the, question, the question will be, one of the four NWO of in Thailand's BCG strategy is collaboration with international partners, such as technology demonstration and localization on joint research and investment. So today we kick off our collaboration with 
this forum, exchanging our experience and lesson learned. What do you think can be a way forward for Thai-Danish collaboration on the BCG economy model? May I start with His Excellency, Mr. Jan Tuoko, Ambassador of Denmark to Thailand, please. Thank you very much. I think there is no doubt that this meeting today, the knowledge exchange, is definitely the answer. I have been here now more, more than a year, and I think where we need to start is to identify the demand, the challenges, and the opportunities. And today we heard about different challenges Thailand is facing, but also opportunities like sandbox. And I'm certainly sure that there is a good match between the different sectors we are working within. It's a huge priority for Thailand to work within the agricultural sector. I see a good match in that sector. And there's also a very good match when it comes to the smart city agenda, and of course also the energy. So it's important to identify the challenges and the demands in order to actually make very concrete where we should work together. And I think when we meet with municipalities, the large companies like CP, we can identify these opportunities. But I think it's important that we also boost the existing knowledge about where we already cooperate, because I think we can do even more within the sectors. I visited the University of Chiang Mai and saw that quite a few corporations were already existing. I visited the municipality of Konsumui, I could see more opportunities. So it is back to what we did before COVID-19. We visited each other, we had delegations, and now we try to facilitate the knowledge exchange online. But let's hope that we will come back to some kind of normalcy and see some exchange of knowledge physically in the near future. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, His Excellency. Uh, I think Nasda would welcome you for the first place, you know, if you want to visit anywhere. Uh, so next, I would like to ask Dr. Narong to uh, uh, answer this question, please. Thank you, Dr. Lily. Nasda has a number of projects involving the BCG concept which are conducted by our experienced uh, researchers. Those projects cover areas such as food and agriculture, environmental, health and medicine, and of course, energy. As a national research agency, I would like certainly say that building a collaboration between NASDA and Dennis Research Institution to conduct research and innovation together under the BCG area would be a good starting point. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Narong. And next, Dr. Kanchana, please. Yes, uh, I, I have mentioned that one of the key success factors is we have to be focused. <laughs> so, uh, and, and I think we should start with our strength. Uh, and that's needs uh, a forum like this uh, to identify our strengths, our interests, and select what we would like to focus. Uh, I, I would like to also extend uh, my invitation to uh, uh, our friends uh, in Denmark and also audience uh, for this forum that uh, uh, Nexpo has initiated this policy platform uh, for exchanging ideas and uh, also we hope that it will be a good starting point for future collaboration. Uh, so uh, with that, I think we should uh, continue uh, on exploring uh, our common interests. Uh, and some of the ideas that I, I, I have highlighted in my presentation, the sandbox program, I have listened to uh, other uh, uh, speakers. I think what we are exploring here, uh, you guys have already uh, done that for years. So I think that's a very good starting point that you know we, we could learn from you on the way symbiosis, biosis, uh, the food. Uh, uh, circular food waste, the uh, reverse logistic, and even construction. It's just exactly <laughs> coincidence that you, you have uh, done all this program that we think are the, the key uh, pivoting uh, point in, in uh, anchor the circular economy. And also, um, I think the BCG, a number of area on the economy that uh, we can learn from you. So with that, uh, uh, I would, uh, next call would be, uh, with, with our partners, we'll be happy to facilitate future discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Thank you. Uh So let's hear from uh, Denmark's uh, panelists. Uh, let's start from Mr. Norbert, please. 
uh, he's not coming back yet, I guess. Uh, maybe I move to Mr. Mortensen, please. <clears throat> Thank you very much. Uh, I think I'll start out by, by echoing what Ambassador Torgor said um, uh, and the previous speaker also about focus, but we need to, to find the challenges and the demand. From our side at State of Green, what, what we can do is uh, we can offer assistance in, uh, in uh, setting up and fostering relationships between uh, Thai and, and Danish uh, stakeholders. Uh, we can arrange uh, visits uh, in Denmark if you want to meet with government officials or business officials. And I think also another possibility, it's not yet certain, but I hope that from State of Green's side, we will be able to share internationally some of the recommendations, more than 400 recommendations from the Danish climate partnerships, including the partnership on circular economy. I think there's a lot of uh, interesting stuff there that can be shared. Thank you. Thank you. I'm sure that once the you know the situation of COVID will subside, we will you know what uh, Denmark would be one of the countries that we would like to visit first. So let's uh, move to Mr. Lawson, please. Thank you so much, uh, and, and uh, I would like to uh, just to follow in the in the same track as as the previous speakers. But I I think now we have uh, 400 years of a very close relationship and friendship and, and why not build on top of that because we already have like uh, mutual trust and, and friendship uh, as our basic platform and and therefore we can still develop by uh, exchanging delegations sharing knowledge sharing ideas sharing uh, the innovation that is needed and gradually that would lead to some partnerships even also commercially and business like so i think that would be uh, an approach and um, I think we have, even though we are so far apart, even though we have so many differences, also in the way our climate and, and geography is, I think we can still build on, on the same kind of mindset in developing and creating. Thanks so much. That's very interesting. Thank you very much. Uh, so now is your turn, Mr. Jokinson, please. Yeah. I think our two countries are very similar in the way that we are based on resources from uh, the sea, from the land, ecological resources that we turn into valuable products. Even though they are so different, the resources, the plants, the fish, the, the seaweeds are very different. I think the technologies that we can use to increase productivity, but also to uh, make new products are very generic. And we have a lot of uh, research platforms that I think we could share with scientists from Thailand, and uh, we are very happy to uh, exchange personnel uh, within this area. Thank you very much. Um, how about you, Mr. Tors? Do you have any thought on that, please? Thank you very much. Uh, I'd like to follow Mr. Mortensen. Uh, Bornholm like to be a place where you can visit and see for yourself how we handle uh, this waste problem and circular economy. Uh, we have a, a lot of experience and uh, as you uh, can see, we have reached a lot and uh, we are proud to show it to you. Thank you very much, Mrs. Tors. So now it's time that we would like to go to the questions in the chat box and uh, our team will share the questions on the screen now. And um, I think we will try to see who should help with the questions. So the first question would be, what extent do the Danish Academia and Research Institute involved with the government's policy making in this issue? So I guess this question will go for Mr. Jokinson to help first. Yes, please, I will be happy to answer that. Uh, because I think it's a really good question. Um, we have, uh, as earlier stated, a very close collaboration uh, between uh, academia and uh, the government structure, but also uh, with, with uh, industries. And uh, I, I have a seat in the National Bioeconomy Panel that uh, Mr. Norberg uh, mentioned earlier as one of the instruments to drive the development within circular bioeconomy. 
that's one uh, issue. We also do a lot of uh, policy support from our uh, uh, university. We have a long history on that. And that makes uh, a direct link uh, between research and uh, new policies. So I think uh, this is also an area where we could share uh, knowledge uh, how to, to support uh, the government with uh, uh, new policies, basic uh, knowledge for uh, preparing new policies, of course. Thank you very much. I think that's clear. Uh, may I go to the second question if no one wants to add anything? Okay, I'll go to the second question. How did Denmark successfully harmonize the policy and implementation of circular economy in all relevant stakeholders, namely government, private sectors, communities, and what are the critical key success factors? May I ask State of Green to help with these questions, please? Yeah, I th well, I think again, um... We're not there yet, you could say, uh, but but I think the uh, the notion of close cooperation and inclusion in, uh, in in formulation of government policy is is key is a key factor here. Um, we have a tradition for uh, involvement. You, if you have, if the government wants to to present new law. They will talk to the business organizations, to the local communities, et cetera, hear their viewpoints on it before they actually move ahead. So I would say that that would be one of the ways to harmonize the policy and implementation also when it comes to the circular economy. But uh, it could be that one of my colleagues would, would delve further into it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so, may I go to the third question, if no one wants to add anything yet? Okay. So, the third question is about re so reforestation or supporting planting the economy plantation in mitiga mitig mitigating the carbon emission. I think in Thailand, we have great opportunity in expanding the forestry sites, but the Thai government seems to overlook this sector, which actually answers all the BCG model. I think that is very important. So I'm not sure who from Denmark could help us with the this question, please. Okay, Mr. Jokinson, please. Thank you. We have a national policy of doubling our uh, planted area with forest. Uh, we are not there yet. Uh, it's a slow process. Uh, we are raising more forest uh, each year. We also have a discussion of whether this is the right strategy. Uh, because uh, forestries are not always as productive. Uh, that means they don't sequester as much carbon as does efficient agricultural areas. So it may be that we can produce more biomass for the bioeconomy from uh, uh, agriculture than from forestry. But this is an ongoing discussion. And of course, we need forest as well also to create biodiversity. I think I totally agree with you. and. Um... Okay, I hope the, the, the person who asked question got the answer. And I've got the next question for Dr. Narong. He even said, oh, is she? Yeah, asked Dr. Narong directly, would you consider food inopolis as bioeconomy and how to use interdisciplinary to expand it? Dr. Narong, do you have like short questions, a short answer for that? Yeah, of course, the food in the police can be one of the tasks and area that the bioeconomy has to look deeply into because, as I mentioned, one of the industry is food. And also, we're going to do some of the circular economy on food as well. That is food waste and food loss. That it take about 30% of the food loss in Thailand. If we can reduce that uh, number now to let's say 10 to 15, we can increase about uh, a lot of uh, effectiveness of uh, using of our biomass as well. So the answer is yes, that the food monopolies can be a part of the uh, bioeconomy and we're going to put it in our agenda as well. Thank you. Thank you very, for the very clear answer. And this is the last question from the audience. Could you please share the experience on circular design? I guess that we could have answer from Denmark as well as from Dr. Cantona as well. So from Denmark's side, uh, circular economy actually can go to many people. Uh, how about Mr. Tors? 
Uh, on Bornholm, we have uh, recycled uh, this day too. Uh, uh, a lot of our uh, waste is uh, going back to production. Uh, one of the examples is uh, we, I showed you a picture of, of the site where we uh, uh, do do this uh, these things. You can place uh, uh, wood in in one container. You can uh, put glass in another container. You can put uh, use the computers in a third container, you can put uh, plastic and so on. So we have, this is uh, one of the ways you can, you can uh, uh, do it and it's uh, in a way that people understand and uh, support. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Kansida, do you have any thought on this or you would go to send your sandbox? Uh, yeah, I, I shared on some, some uh, experience. Actually, we are uh, working on this uh, circular economy design platform at the moment. And uh, the basic concept is basically you you have to close the loop, right? So uh, you, you got to understand the value chain and, and how you close the loop. And and uh, I can talk also after this, we have uh, example from textile electronics uh, and, and try to create business opportunity from from there, so uh, we uh, for our Thai audience, we are at the moment uh, uh, actually we just kickstart this uh, program. Uh, we looking for uh, uh, entrepreneurs or even university that would be interested in being uh, a node for circular design platform. Uh, so basically, we got some training program on for that. And uh, that's that's my short answer for that. But basically, the concept is trying to close the loop and finding business opportunity out of that. And then uh, along that, you have to go clear all the rule and regulation and, and help uh, accelerating and bring them to point. Thank you. Thank you for the uh, very good answer. Um, so I think, uh, oh, we got the Mr. Novak back. Actually, we have questions for you, but uh, do you remember which question? The, the number two, maybe. There's some question for for that might be suitable for you, Mr. Nobag. Would you like to uh, yes, please reply to that? Uh, okay. So that's the question. So basically, how we how Denmark harmonized the policy? Some people already. Uh, give some reply, so maybe you can share your thought as well on that. Um, well, uh, this is a very broad question, and I think that uh, it points at uh, the process that we are we are working in the, at the moment. That that trying to to look at um, all the different sectors and involving um, all the effects in different areas when we we try to come up with the with the right solutions um, would the is a, a specific point in the question that is uh, needs to be elaborated and i think it's a i think it's kind of a big question to answer in a very short time, but I think uh, basically some of our uh, panelists also shared uh, some thought already and maybe add to that is your, your idea as well. So yeah, I think I, I would stop here and uh, thank you very much all of the panelists for your contribution. And uh, I think we come to the end of the events today. And I would like to thank all the panelists who give us the very insightful information. And thank you also to all questions from our audience. Uh, thank you all parties who joined hands to, in organizing this event, the Royal Thai Embassy in Denmark, Thailand's Board of Investment, and of course, NASDAQ. Our seminar series will continue tomorrow and the day after. So we do hope that you all could join us then. For today, goodbye, and please stay safe. And see you again tomorrow. For the audience, uh, for the panelists and uh, special guests, can you stay on for a moment? We like to take a photo of everyone here. Thank you. So on the queue, one, two, three. Smile.
Again, one, two, two, BCG. <laughs> Thank you very much for today and goodbye. Bye. Bye.